This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. Good morning. My name is Dr. Didi Wolfarth, and I'm going to talk to you today about practicing cultural humility. Before we get going, it's really important to say that in extraordinary times, we do extraordinary things. So I'm recording from home, I'm recording in the morning, and uh, things may happen. Trains may go by, uh, people may walk behind me, even though it's early in the morning. So we're just going to have to roll with things, and that's kind of how it goes. So let's get rolling. Your first question you might ask is, who are you and what makes you an expert in this stuff? You know, that's a really good question. I teach at Spalding University. I'm the director of the Child, Adolescent, Family Emphasis Area. My degree is in clinical psychology, and I've been a pract practicing psychologist for more than 20 years. I practice in both Indiana and Kentucky, and I'm still learning. I still make mistakes every day. I mean, even though I see the intersection between poverty and racism and multi-generational challenged families, I still know that I make mistakes every day in terms of how I understand how those things come together in people. So I really work hard to try to always be learning. I'm not perfect and I'm gonna make mistakes today. I'm gonna to make mistakes when I present. So to say I'm an expert, I would really rather say that I'm a learner. I should say too that this presentation will be about an hour and there'll be times that I pause and you can you know, think about what would I say or do? What would we, we have an activity? Um, usually when I do this presentation in real life, I ask people to say, oh, write down some descriptions about me. Where do you think I live? Who am I? You assume I'm a middle-aged white woman. What else do you assume? What else do you assume about my sexual orientation? What do you assume about who I live with? And it's really interesting of how we make all these assumptions, but we never want to talk about them, about people. So I'm not going to pause right now. I just really want you to think about what are your assumptions about me based on the little tiny bit that you know. So let's begin with a centering quote. You only need to claim the events of your life to make yourself yours. When you truly possess all you have been and done, you are fierce with reality. And that's what I want today. We want you to be fierce with reality because that gives you a lot of space to move in your life when you're fierce with reality. So the big question, really what we're talking about today is how do we get better at relating people who are different than us? I mean, this is really what it's about. This is what the whole idea of cultural humility is. So I'm gonna propose three different ways that we can get better at relating to people different than us. We're gonna talk about if those three ways work or not. The third way is gonna be cultural humility, just to spoil the surprise for you. And every time you see a number like that, it means I'm introducing a really new big topic. Uh, what are the three ways? Um, you have to wait till the end for cultural humility, but let's keep going. Let's keep going on way number one. Way number one, we get better at relating to people different than us is cultural competence. Now, most businesses have a cultural competence, uh, adopted a, a framework of cultural competence. Humana, JCPS, Jefferson County Public Schools, um, Papa John's, Spalding, where I work, um, UPS, they all have competency, cultural competency frameworks. Let's talk about cultural competence for a minute. Cultural competence is this whole idea that if you work hard and learn enough things, you can get better at relating to people who are different than you. You can start to be more efficient and productive and competent in your relationships with them. Okay, there's a big problem with cultural competence. And the problem is really summed up in this picture. Let's look at this picture for a minute. It's like, wow. I can stand next to other attractive, thin people for the rest of this photo shoot in our well-dressed clothes with good hygiene, and we are competent because we can stand next to each other for the length of this photo shoot. In fact, we look so competent that we kind of look kind of smug. And that's not really 
a way to get us towards working well with other people. Because at its worst, cultural competence is thinking that we know everything or that we can learn everything. See, the problem with cultural competence is that it implies that there's some sort of endpoint, some sort of place we can get to a cultural nirvana where it's like, we have seen the light. We can always be competent in dealing with all people in all situations. That's kind of crazy when you really think about it. Can you really ever be competent to deal with all people different than you across sexual orientation and gender and ethnicity and race, social economic status, disability status, weight status, everything else? Can you really be competent with all of those different people who are different than you? Can I be confident in that? No. Here's the other problem with the cultural competence model. So there's, of all these models have multiple components. Cultural, com cultural competence has three main components, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And I'm summarizing like a bajillion articles of research in like one minute right here for you. The problem with cultural competence emphasizing knowledge, skills, and attitudes is that it really highly emphasizes knowledge. And it really highly emphasizes skills, but it really doesn't take into account as much attitudes. And there's a problem with that attitude thing. Actually, there's a problem with a specific kind of attitude. It's called stereotypes. And that's really the problem. Because yes, we all have stereotypes. So close your eyes for a minute. See, it's just like this little kid's doing, just close your eyes. Seriously, nobody's looking at you. You're fine. So what I want you to think about is get a mental image of your grandparents, okay? whoever they are, step-grandparents, adoptive grandparents, doesn't matter, paternal, maternal, I don't care. The people who are the older people who helped to raise you in that the generation. Okay? Get a good image of grandparents, great-grandparents. Everybody got a good image in your mind? Okay, imagine those people for a minute. Okay. Are your grandparents just a tad racist. Maybe just a little bit, like they said some things that were a little off color. They did, they're nice people, but did they maybe say that? Or maybe are your grandparents just a little bit sexist and reinforced traditional gender roles? Or a little bit heterosexist and said some things against LGBTQ people? Is it possible that although you didn't want it to happen, that some of those ideas you, you heard from your grandparents imprinted themselves on you. You didn't try to think these negative things about other people, but they just got in there. Is that possible? Well, yeah, it's possible. In fact, it's almost impossible that it didn't happen, right? And whether it was your grandparents or whether it was the broader the culture, you've absorbed messages about stereotypes. What? Why? Why do we believe this stuff? Stereotypes, like negative biases against other groups that are different than you. Why do we believe this stuff? Well, part of the reason is our neurology, okay? Neurons, neurons, nerve cells in your brains, they're always trying to connect with other neurons, okay? They want to build connections because they want your brain to be super efficient, super fast, super strong connections because stronger connections means a more efficient brain, blah, 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 blah. Because your brain is always trying to pair one piece of information with another piece of information, okay? Because it wants to make thinking faster, your brain does. So your brain's goal is to look like the superhighway on the left and not the country winding road on the right. Mm, mm, I say this, I have to think, think, think. Mm, your brain doesn't want to do that. It wants to put stuff together fast. In fact, your brain, why are we stereotype? And why our brains are organized this way is the same reason you organize stuff in your house. Hang with me for a minute on this. I don't care how messy you are. I don't care how messy you are. You don't put your stamps with your soccer stuff. You don't put your basil with your bras. And so every time you want to cook spaghetti, you're like, oh, where's my basil? Oh, here it is. I keep it with my bras. You just don't do it. You, you, don't, put, you don't put things together that don't make sense, right? What does that mean? What you're trying to do is when you go to look for one thing, you find the other thing. When you go to look for your raincoat, you're hoping to find your umbrella. 
you're not going to look for your raincoat and hoping you can find like your empty pop bottle collection, right? Not gonna help you. So you try to put things together in some kind of way that you can find it efficiently. That's the same reason your brain is stereotyping. You're trying to organize your world. It's not your fault you have stereotypes. Doesn't mean we have to hold on to them. We need to recognize them, but it's not your fault you have them, okay? So what does that mean? We get categories in our head of things that we don't wanna believe that are true, but we've heard it so much and we've put the information together so much just by our culture, just by hearing it, that we think things. And I'm gonna say some things that are offensive right now that are things that you might have heard. Things like Muslim equal terrorist or gay equal flamboyant or Mexican equal undocumented or black equal poor or black man equal violent or all this stuff that doesn't make sense or white person equal entitled or obese person equal lazy. We don't want to believe those things, but most of us have come to believe some of those things. So it's really hard for us because what we're asking you to do is to break some of those things that you've heard, those, that neurology, we're asking you to disrupt those connections between the neurology. That's called learning and that's really, really hard to do. So because of all those things we've heard, we all have stereotypes about other people. If we were in a face-to-face -face, um, workshop, I would ask each of you to pick one of these six faces on the screen. And I would ask you to write for five minutes about that person. Where do they live? Who do they live with? What are your stereotypes about that person? What are your adjectives that come to mind when you describe that person? Tell me that person's history or life. And you would be, I don't even know the right word, amazed and surprised um, at what, when we're being honest and we're not censoring ourselves, what we write when we talk about other people, the assumptions we make. So uh, we're gonna get into another brain thing here and I'm gonna summarize a lot of research in a few minutes. Our default style is to put people into groups. That's our brains again. Our brains are wanting to categorize too. And so if people look different than us based on their skin color, their hair color, their hair texture, they're wearing different clothes, whatever it is, we tend to put them into groups. In fact, in an ambiguous situation, um, imagine, imagine you're going into a big conference and it's lunch and you don't know anyone and you have to quickly decide who do you sit with. What do you do? You don't even know what you do probably. Okay, you're looking for empty seats, but you're also looking for the group of people who looks most like you. You are, you're not trying to tell yourself that you are, but you are. So you're looking for yourself for people who look like your skin color, your, your sexual orientation perceived as much as you can guess it, your race, your ethnicity, your age, whatever factors we can quickly quickly scan a room while you're sitting there holding your tray of lunch, you're deciding where, who do you want to sit with? So my grandma, my mom, for example, would be totally going for people with like bird sweatshirts or grandma sweatshirts or, you know, 70 year old white-ish, she, she's older than 70, but that's okay. 70-ish oldish white people with bird shirts on, she'd be like, I found my people, I'm sitting with them. You won't believe how much we have in common. Okay, why do I, I'm not slamming my mother, why do we do that thing, right? We do that thing because we wanna make connections with other people and we think it's more likely we'd be able to make a connection, a human connection with someone who we think of as similar to us. And deep down, we're afraid that someone who looks different than us might reject us. And that's really, really, really too painful for us. So we try our bets with someone who we think will accept us. A logical step after you connect with people, so say you sit with other white people, other black people, or Asian people, whatever it is at the lunch table, right? Other men, other women. It's really, really easy to get from here to demonizing or otherizing people, right? Because what happens is you start to make 
stories about the people who sit at the different lunch tables. You start to say like, they wouldn't like me. They're different than me. And you start to gossip and whisper and talk about your table with the other tables, right? We learn at a really young age to fear what's different. And so we start putting people in categories that are different than us. You know when this is the worst? This is the very worst if we think that things are scarce. If the other people are coming to take something that belongs to us. So if we think resources are scarce, like if someone can make us believe that jobs are scarce and other people are coming from other countries to take our jobs, then we're really, really likely to otherize and to demonize the other group. Or if people believe that they're coming to take our land or our money or our women, whatever you want to say there, our, our mar marriage ageable partners. Or if we believe that people are coming to take our way of life, that our very way of life, our culture is threatened, then we're going to likely really fight and say, those people are wrong. Now, sometimes people say, that, I don't do that. I don't do that. Let me go back to high school for a minute. I know it's kind of painful for some of us, but let's go back there for a minute. Imagine yourself in high school for a minute. Imagine your sibling goes to the same school. Imagine you're a sophomore. Okay, they have this thing that says, okay, the teachers say, we're going to have a big pizza party at the end of the year where the class who raises the most money in the canned food drives and comes up with the best theme for Spirit Week and has the most students participate and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, this sophomore female is against her senior brother, right? They're in competition with each other because there's only one pizza party. And you can start to really not like your brother or your sister. You can start to be like trying to trick them, trying to secret them out as far as what their theme is, trying to steal the canned goods before everybody else does because you want to win one pizza party because there's only one pizza party, right? And only one great can win it. So there's a perceived scarcity of resources like I just talked to you about. And so you could really start to be against people even though you really weren't. And that pizza on a slide, dang, that looks really good right now. If you don't believe me this happened, you're like, yeah, that was high school. You know, I'm more, I've come a long way since high school. I'm sure you have, thank God we all have, right? But what about another example? What if it's the big game? What if it's, this is UK versus U of L, what if it's this game that really matters, an important game? Like you make it into the tournament if you win this game, or you win the tournament, or you win the conference. Or what if you say things like this? It's not about the game. It's about their fans and our fans. Our fans have integrity and class. Their fans, they do this or that. They have a cheapskate program. They do one and done. They have all sorts of scandals. They keep my car. They, their fans are bad. What are we doing there, right? We're otherizing other people when resources are scarce. If there's only one game that you can win, resources are scarce. And it's easy for that setup to make you hate someone else. The cultural competence model, that model number one, it doesn't really emphasize any of these attitudes. And the attitudes are really, really important because I'm hoping or thinking that I might have talked to you about one thing that at least resonated with you a little bit. So the cultural competence model, it doesn't really work so well. Let's talk about a second model because you know cultural competence, it's not really flying. Cultural color blindness. Let's talk about color blindness or color muteness. In fact, this is what this model is. We don't talk about color. We don't see color. It doesn't exist. No, 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 no. Not going to talk about it. What are we talking about really here? Um, we're talking about we don't see color. We don't talk about color here. It's what's inside a person that counts. Um, 
We don't talk about race. All people are equal. All lives matter. Can't we just all get along? We all bleed red. Okay, you've heard these things, right? In fact, colorblindness is the number one most popular way to talk about race, culture, multicultural among white parents. Number one way. 70% of all white, this is research from white mothers of uh, preschoolers, the number one way they adopt as far as how do I teach kids about culture is colorblind. Don't see it. Um, white families who live in predominantly white areas, homogenously like suburbs typically, um, those families are particularly likely to adopt a colorblind approach. But even families, white families who live in integrated areas still often adopt a colorblind approach. What's wrong with the colorblind approach? One big huge problem, people who profess to be colorblind actually commit more microaggressions than people who admit their biases. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? I said people who say they're colorblind or think they're colorblind actually commit more microaggressions than people who admit they have biases. In other words, if we admit our biases and admit our stereotypes like we just talked about in the first thing, we're better off at relating to people different than us, if we can be honest and acknowledging those. So we got to talk about microaggressions for a minute. I'm going to be, I'm, some of you know this, I'll be kind of quick. Um, what's a microaggression? Brief, everyday indignities that are verbal, behavioral, environmental. They can be intentional, they can be unintentional. We'll talk about that. They're communicated to women, people of color, gay, lesbian people, uh, people of different races, and they have an insulting message behind them that can cause severe psychological distress and harm. Okay, that's the textbook definition. Oh, but the truth is always harder than textbook definitions. We commit microaggressions regularly, like daily. There's a study from, this is for teachers, right? And you ask college students of color, do microaggressions happen on your campus? And 65% of students of color say, yes, they do regularly. 44% of students of color say they experience overt racism regularly, which is even worse. But here's the part of, that's gonna be really uncomfortable. The students of color who say, the 65% of students who say, yeah, I regularly experience microaggressions on my college campus. It happens evenly in graduate and undergraduate classes. You know what that means? It means that education doesn't make us better at this. And microaggressions are perpetrated equally by my professor as my classmates. That's not good, people. That means that we, oh, we people in charge, we people who think we know what we're doing, we people don't know sometimes. So give me some examples of microaggressions, right? What am I talking about? These are straight from the internet. You can lift them there yourself, but I'll just read them real quick. So like, what are you? Have you ever had real sex? Are you even legal? Why do you sound white? That's back in a compliments, right? You're real pretty for a dark skin girl. The limited representation of my race in your classroom does not make me the voice of all black people. So you're Chinese, right? So who's the man in the relationship? Why do microaggressions matter? Why do these things matter? Got a little cartoon there if you want to read it. Why do microaggressions matter? Because here's the health outcomes associated with microaggressions. When people experience microaggressions, they show decreased concentration, decreased academic performance higher rates of anxiety, depression, feeling like imposter syndrome and they don't belong, higher blood pressure, worse overall health outcomes, poor social outcomes, lower self-esteem, experience internalized racism or sexism or heterosexism. Do you want to be responsible for making another human being feel those things? Because that's a lot of burden, right? The things you say can impact people by that list. The things I say, can make people experience those things. That's not okay with me. 
I'm sure it's not okay with you. Now, sometimes what happens with microaggressions is this whole big thing about impact and intent. Impact is not intent. So people say, I didn't mean it that way. I didn't mean, I didn't mean it that way. That's not what I meant. Okay, you, you, most people are not trying to deliberately say something mean. Some people are, but most people aren't. So the only, if you say that's not what I meant, it doesn't matter what you meant, it matters how it lands. And if it lands in a way that hurts someone else, then it is a microaggression. It's defined by the person who's on the receiving end, not by the person who's on the giving end, right? So what does that mean? That means that if you're gonna say, if you're confronted with a microaggression, if you're gonna say, I didn't mean it that way, you better quickly follow it with, but I understand why you heard it that way, and I'm sorry. Because it doesn't matter what your intention was, it matters how it landed. Important kind of note on this, your awkwardness is not as important as someone else's pain. Their pain is more important than your feeling awkward in the moment. So a big problem with colorblindness, right, is the colorblindness, more microaggressions. Another big problem with colorblindness is it's not really neutral. People think it's neutral, but it's not. It just maintains the status quo. Okay. So what do people say? People say things like, well, we should respect all lives. It's not black lives matter, it's all lives matter. Or people say things like, gay people, gay people are just wanting special rights. Or people say, how come there's not any program for just regular white people? Like there's all these special programs for other people, but how come there's not any program for just regular white people? So people say things like that, they, assuming that the world is neutral. What's wrong with maintaining the status quo? Well, why is the status quo a problem? Ominous um, dark clouds, the scariest picture I could find on the internet to say, ooh, bad things are coming. We're gonna talk for just a few minutes about privilege. This privilege is a really important part of understanding the status quo. Imagine, if you will, that our whole society is like a big soccer game, a big, huge soccer game, and we're playing on a field that's tilted, right? Like, just like the picture. So let's imagine you're the goalie on the top. You're the goalie up here. Ba, 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 I'm an awesome goalie. I'm killing it. I'm going to be goalie of the year. I'm going to make all conference. I'm going to make all state. I'm all that and a bag of chips, because I'm amazing. And imagine you're the defenders, right? And you're like, we're so good at defenders. We just like tink the ball, kick it a little tiny bit, tink, and it rolls like 40 yards down the field. We're amazing like that. Yeah, we're good. All right, imagine you're this goalie. What the heck? Like everything's working against you. Imagine you're these defenders, right? Like this is crazy hard to try to defend your goal when everything in the world, the whole society, the whole field, gravity is working against you. Yet people say that the field is level. And so people believe that the field is level. Some people, well, we'll talk about that later, but some people even believe that the field is tilted towards people of color in favor of them. I say that because I'm white skin. What we're talking about with privileges is benefits you get from living in society that are unearned, that are based on your skin color, your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, your social economic status, your weight, your physical mobility, your age, your religion, a lot of other things. And society privileges a lot of folks in a lot of different ways. Let me give you eight quick examples of privilege. It's gonna be quick, trust me, we don't have that long. Okay, historical privilege. Who writes history books? Predominantly white, Christian, male, heterosexual people. So things that need to be talked about are really glossed over. Native American genocide, American slavery, African-American slavery, Jim Crow, I'm reading, by the way, uh, those, the Warmth of Other Suns, amazing book. But we can't make ugly things disappear. When we really tell the truth, if you're white, your ancestors don't look very good if you tell the truth. 
if you're white, we need to talk about colonialism and neocolonialism. We, we need to talk about some really ugly truths that we don't want to talk about. And really, we don't talk about those things. The past is really glassed over as if it's the past and the remnants of that don't maintain today, which they do. And so we want to say it's done, it's over, that was in the past. And that's a real problem. We need to come to reckoning with some of our historical past. But we have historical privilege if we're white because we tell the story, we white people, of how we want the story told. We want our ancestors to look good. Political privilege. I chose this picture on purpose because it takes a sacred place of Native American ground and made it into a monument to white history, white colonialism. Let's talk about political privilege for a minute. White men make up 31% of the US population, but 65% of our elected offices. Why is that? Those numbers don't match. Women make up 50% of the population, about half of us are women, but only 23% of elected offices. Shouldn't that number be closer to 50%? White people make up about 63% of the population, but they hold 87% of the elected offices. Hmm. In other words, people of color hold only about 13% of elected offices. Gay people make up about, it depends, the numbers here are range, but let's say 4% of the population is a fair estimate. But gay folks make up about 0.1% of elected offices. That's not fair representation. There's also residential privilege. This is Louisville, but this could be anywhere. There's a really good book called The Color of Law about this, but the process of redlining, which was sanctioned by the US government, enforced by banks, which was official government policy, is that black and brown skinned people could only live in areas that were red, that were poor. And if a black or brown person tried to apply for a loan, there's different categories of how housing was from red was the worst, then yellow, then blue, then green. And so you'll if a black or brown person went to apply for a loan to live in a green area, they would get denied every time. And you notice that the green areas never um, touch the red areas. So there's these buffer areas. There's these yellow and blue areas that are like buffer areas that are between um, neighborhoods. So that systematically, that people of color are slotted into poor neighborhoods, right? And things like the GI Bill that was not available to African-American soldiers returning from war made this even more problematic, right? This is codified. This is not just like a few people doing bad things. This is official government policy. Financial privilege is another example. This number is gonna not be comfortable for you, but for every $100 that a white family has in wealth, so I just imagine it that way, like every family, just think about for every $100 that a white family has, how much do you think an African-American family has? Take a guess, seriously, take a guess right now. The answer is between, what do you think? You're supposed to guess, come on now. Okay, good guess, good, good guess. The answer is between five and $10, that for every $100 of wealth a white family has, a black family has between five and $10. What does that mean, stacked up? That's that uneven playing field, right? Because that, could you do with 90 or $95 more for every 100? Yeah, 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 you could. Another example of privilege is educational privilege. And I could go soapboxing on this, but I won't, but the gap is getting bigger in our public education system, not smaller. That's why we have this picture of the gap. Whether you look at reading levels, fourth grade proficiency, outcome measures, assessment of educational progress on the national level, the gaps getting wider between whites, people of color, special education, not special education, students on free or reduced lunches, students not on free or reduced lunches. We're not getting better at what we're doing as far as education. Another way to look at this is black and brown schools are not even of white schools. They're more likely to be closed. They're more likely to emphasize discipline. 
They're less likely to have AP classes and accelerated classes and dual credit classes. They're less likely to have sports and clubs. They're more likely to have teachers who um, have had problems or, or end up slotted to the poor schools. Not that there's not amazing teachers in um, poor schools, there are, but predominantly our black and brown schools are our poor schools, which is a problem, right? So there's educational privilege. There's employment privilege. If everything was even, then we would see equal representation of folks in the STEM field, right? But we don't see that. If race and gender didn't affect the subjects we taught, then, then our numbers would be even. Like 50% of women would be going into chemistry, 50% of women would be going into math, 50% of computer programmers would be women. We don't see that. The numbers of like, for example, African-Americans, like 12% um, of a population, our population is African-American, yet only 6% of computer programmers are black. This makes sense. Latinos, about 16% of our population is Latinx, but only 3% of the population of chemists are, are Latina. Why is that? Why, why aren't black and brown skinned people and women pursuing lucrative fields in STEM? What's going on? Because there's, there's barriers to keep people out and we need to recognize those barriers. There's employment barriers every which way. CEOs and how many are people of color and how many are women. Okay, I said I'd be quick. I'm gonna go back. I'm talking about eight quick examples of privilege. Let's talk about health privilege. Oh my gosh, the, the health disparities among African-American and Latina people. COVID-19 bring those into a really strong relief, but even before COVID-19, health outcomes are not equal. More likely to be diabetic, more likely to die from breast cancer. Medical doctors today, a predominant medical doctors still believe that African-American patients have higher pain tolerance than white people. So they prescribe less pain medication. What the heck? This is like recent studies, right? Black women die at a higher rate during childbirth, less likely to get the care they need. There's, it, the list goes on and on and on. Your zip code can partly determine how long you're going to live. That shouldn't be. Your race and your social economic status should not be so closely tied with your health outcomes. That's privilege. And then there's legal privilege. Oh my gosh, this one, we get soapbox here for a long time. I'm not gonna soapbox here, I promise. We just look at this slide. A white person, a Latino person, an African-American person, they all commit the same crime. This is of people under 18. What happens? Who's most likely to receive an adult prison sentence? You can see it on the screen. An African-American youth is nine times more likely than a white kid to get an adult prison sentence, to be sentenced as an adult. Latino youth four times as likely as a white person. Whether you look at police chases, police brutality, police, it doesn't, how people are convicted, who's stopped, who's frisked, the whole legal system, the whole policing system shows tons of examples of privilege. I'm not anti-police, okay? I respect the work the police do. What we have, we have a problem. We have a problem because we have racism in our society. And then we have the power of what happens when you are a police officer. And so when you connect unexamined privilege with power, we have some problems in that system. I will belabor the point. So, so some people, when I, they get to this point in the presentation, they're like, look, okay, look. Some of those things might be true, but those things aren't my fault. They are not my fault. I, I didn't, it's not my fault that the soccer field is uneven. It's not my fault society is tilted like this. Look, I, but maybe those things are true, but I didn't cause them. I didn't do them. They're not my fault. This is where it gets really hard because there has to be an opposite thing. So if you agree with me that there's some oppression in society, then you have to agree that there's some privilege in society. It can't work any other way. So some people benefit more from 
the soccer field or the society being tilted than other people. So it's not a matter of like feeling bad for the people who are down. It's recognizing if you're down, then you're up because there's no neutral here, right? There's no, there's nothing level. So if you're recognize and you agree that some people are marginalized by society, then if you're not in the marginalized group, then by definition, you have to be in the group that's doing the oppression. That's not comfortable for people. And that's not comfortable for anybody. Now, the next slide I'm going to show you, I'm going to stop for a minute, and you're going to be like, holy moly, you're not going to like the slide. If we were in a group, we would do something called privilege bingo, right? And you would see how quickly you could hit privilege bingo. Because there's lots of areas of privilege that are really uncomfortable for us. Let's look at it. Okay, so on your slide right now, you see research supported, I did not make these up, ways in which societal society privileges some people over other people. So if you just take a look at some of those things, you can see that sometimes ways that we don't normally think about being privileged are real privileges. Being tall, being thin, being attractive, supporting a mainstream political party, whether that's Republican or Democrat or independent. Yeah, being mentally healthy. I don't remember if I have up here or not. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Not adopted or in foster care as a child. We never, never talk about that. When I talked earlier about your grandparents, I assumed you knew your grandparents, right? That, that was a, that's a little example of a microaggression because it's doesn't not all people have that situation, right? There's lots of examples of ways that we assume things, the ways that we privilege the things on the board. It's about to get more complicated because the next big idea is intersectionality, right? So everybody's a complex mix of all different kinds of gender and race and sexuality. Every, every human being is a complex person. And what's even more complex is in some ways you're privileged and in some ways you're oppressed. And that makes it really, really, really challenging, right? Because we see all these ways that we're privileged and oppressed, but there's a real problem with this. We really struggle to see our own privilege. Why? Because it's easier for us to look to see what we don't have than what we have. We see where we're treated unfairly because of our gender or our race, but we don't see where we're given a privilege because of our gender or our race or our skin color. I'm blind to those things too. We're all blind to those things. So if you're white, you generally don't see that you're treated preferentially because of your race. If you're a man, you generally don't see that you're pref treated preferentially because of your gender. If you're straight, you generally don't notice that you're treated preferentially because of your sexual orientation. You see the bias that somebody else made. That's not fair that they didn't let that black person, that gay person, that and whatever into the restaurant. But do you see the problem? If you are on the suffering end of it, then you're on the oppressing end of it. So what does that mean? It means that white people think that racism is not their issue. Or it means that men think women's studies is not for them. It, it means that it's not our problem. So why, why don't we see our own privilege? Again, it's how you're hardwired. You are hardwired from your, 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 you know what? Your ancestors were warriors, right? It, because worrying pays off. They paid attention to things in the desert like this scary snake, which by the way, that snake, I like snakes, but that one is particularly scary to me. So your ancestors paid attention to things like that snake in the desert, right? And that's why you're alive today, because the ancestors who didn't pay attention to snakes in the desert, those people are all dead, right? So you have this long history of being hardwired to pay attention to what you lack, right? That's what you do. You focus on the things you need. If you're hungry, you don't think of like, oh, I should do my homework. You're like, I'm too hungry. I'm too hungry. I can't even think until I do my, until I eat something. 
we're hardwired to focus on the things we lack, money, food, private space, whatever it is. The other challenge is, so it's our neurology again. Our brains love problems. That's why we worry so much. Our brains love to solve problems. It's evolutionary adaptive to look for a problem in our society and try to solve it. So when you lay awake at night, you don't lay awake at night thinking of like good things, good things. I love to think of good things. You lay awake at night thinking of problems, right? And if you solve your own problems, you start trying to solve other people's problems in your sleep. You're like, what the heck, brain? Really, why am I doing that? That's not even my problem. Because your brain is hardwired to pay attention to problems and try to solve them. So what does that mean? It means we're constantly looking to ways we're oppressed and not ways we're privileged. Because ways we're privileged is the equivalent of like, that's a good thing. I'm not going to pay any attention to that. Oh, there's two more truths about privilege. It's about to get really, 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 really ugly. Truth number one. If there is one aspect of you that's really marginalized by society, like say that you're really, really poor, it's extraordinarily hard for you to see that you're privileged in any, any other way. So say that you're white. So if you grew up being white and very poor, and someone tries to tell you you're privileged, you're gonna look at them like, you have no idea. And I get, because you're poor, because you grew up poor, that poverty and class are so salient in our society that those things make you feel like being white wasn't an advantage of all. But it still is an advantage to be white, but it's hard for people to see it if they have one aspect of their identity which is very, very marginalized or very oppressed. Truth number two, it's very hard to see privilege if your world is homogenous. If you grew up mostly with other white people, you didn't see that white people were treated better. You saw class being a distinction. You saw gender being a distinction. You're very aware of the fact that you grew up poor white. But if you grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood, predominantly white schools, which most people do, grow up segregated, then you didn't, you can't see easily that being white is an advantage. You can't see that you have something that is um, privileged by society if your whole, your version of society is all homogenous, because you can't compare how you were treated as a poor white person to how a poor black person might be treated. You didn't have that natural laboratory of an experiment, if you will. So whites who experience a lot of economic hardship are more likely to deny racial privilege. That's not good, right? Oh, I told you it's gonna get ugly. Here it gets ugly again. So I, I, white women are not ugly. I like white women. They are me, they are my sisters, they are my friends. They are, you know, they're, they're not ugly, they're amazing. But there's some tricky things with white women. First of all, we easily see our oppression at being women. We see it, we can connect on it. These people in the picture might talk about it, but that makes it harder for us to see a privilege of white skin because we so much see how we're oppressed as women that we don't see how we're privileged by our white skin. And secondly, some of us, not all of us, are partnered with white men. Now, some people might be partnered with a man of color, some people might be not partnered at all, some people might be single, some people might be partnered with women of color, some people might be, you know, okay. okay, so lots of different scenarios here, right? But predominantly, a lot of white women are partnered up with white men. Well, now this just gets real tricky. How can you be wanting to change society if your partner is so privileged by society that you can go to this mall and go to whatever store that is. I have no idea because I don't go to malls. And you can spend money because you have some of those privileges. Or you live in a nice neighborhood because of your partner's income. Or your kids go to a private school. It's really good because of your partner's income. Isn't doing social justice work biting the hand that feeds you? Yeah, it is. And we have to come to grips with that, right? We have to recognize that the house you live in, the neighborhood you live in, your school, your, if you have kids, the school where your kids go to, might be maintained 
by the current system that's at an even playing field, right? And that's really hard for people, right? It's really tough. There's another thing that is, is hard in all this stuff. And when enough people say it's not true, it's not real, it's not real, we start to believe that like white isn't white, white is invisible, white is the default, white is just the background color, why can't we all be Americans? Why do we have to be African Americans and Native Americans? We're all Americans, right? Just come be an American, adopt this white lifestyle, everything's gonna be great. Okay, this is a huge problem, right? Because this contributes to this herd invisibility of like, my skin color makes me invisible. It's the default, it's the neutral. No, not true. And so we, we believe these things because we want to believe that like, I'm innocent, I didn't cause all this oppression. I'm innocent, I don't benefit from privilege. And now it gets really, really, really tricky and ugly because a majority of white people, a majority, believe they suffer from racial discrimination. A majority of white people in the United States believe they suffer from racial discrimination. And they believe, we, white people, believe that racial and ethnic minorities experience um, privileges that they don't. A majority, a majority. Do you, and as this research too, as much as I'd like to tell you that's going away, that is, that's, pretty, that's equally strong among millennials and new folks coming up. So it's not like, oh, that's dying off with each generation. No, it's not. So basically what happens is we all say there's no elephant in the room. We're not gonna talk about this stuff. I wanna maintain my innocence. I wanna maintain my privilege. If you start talking to me about privilege, it's gonna be really uncomfortable. So let's go out of our way to not see our privileges. Um, and so we call people snowflakes or other things when they point out privileges, we're like, man, what are you talking to me about privileges for? Because it's, it's, it's too uncomfortable. We don't want to see all those privileges, right? There's another big idea of meritocracy. And I chose these pictures on purpose. Because what happens is we're often clueless about the ways we're privileged by society. So if a white man, you say, oh, you're so lucky you have this law firm you inherited from your father. And the white man says, I'm not lucky. You don't know how hard I worked in law school. You don't know how hard it was to pass that bar exam. I had to study for so many hours and I had to be in that library studying for a bajillion hours to just to pass that law exam. I worked really hard. And you're left kind of wondering like, what just happened in that conversation? Because the number one thing that a white person does when we're confronted with privilege is we change the conversation from unearned benefits of privilege to earned benefits of how hard we worked or what we did. So we change the whole conversation of talking of instead of privilege, we're much more comfortable talking about our earned benefits instead of our unearned benefits. But the black woman who cleans that white lawyer's office, and I'm, I'm deliberately chose these images because they, not to maintain stereotypes, but to talk to them, talk, talk to you honestly about what happens. The woman who works two jobs to make ends meet, do you think she works hard? Do you think she works just as hard or if not harder than that white lawyer man? So what we happen so is we have this belief that everyone can get ahead in our society if we just work hard enough. We have this belief that if people really wanted jobs, they could get them. We have this belief that this society is an even playing field, but it's not. And so when we just switch the conversations to the benefits we've earned, we really don't hear the story about our unearned benefits. And it's important to talk about privilege and our unearned benefits. Who do you want a privilege anyway? Why the heck are we trying to keep all these privileges? This is where it gets really hard. This is a picture of our four kids. They're a year or two older now, four teenagers. Four white, probably cisgender, probably straight, I don't know that, kids. And I love these kids fiercely the same way if you have children or nieces or nephews or grandchildren, you love them fiercely and you would give them every opportunity you could, every opportunity you could to, to help them in the world. You want them to go to college. You want them to go graduate debt-free. You want, you want a thousand things for your kids, right? You want the same things that I want for my kids. 
But the problem is that some of the things that we're given for our kids means that we're just maintaining the uneven playing field, right? So I don't want my kids to not have to worry about violence or being unfairly imprisoned or a thousand other things. But what I, if I had four Muslim children, would I sleep the same ease I do with four somewhat Christian children? Would I be at ease the same way if I had four black children? If I had four black teenagers, would I sleep as well at night as I had four white teenagers? What about if we were incredibly poor? What about if they were gay or cis transgender? What, would I sleep as easily? No, I would not. And so that's where we really get into this hard, when it becomes personal, when I show you a picture of my kids and say, I want to privilege those people. I want to keep my privileges so I can pass it on to them. It's like our wealth, right? It's why we keep our wealth. We want to, we worked hard for that money. We want to pass it on. Do you see the problem of when we start talking about the personal, it becomes real challenging? This is where it becomes hardest for me too, right? How do I make sense of this everything in my life, when I look at what is the role of privilege, right? Here's the challenge. When you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. So let me tell you what I mean. So white people are often for economic justice. They're often for racial justice, but the research again supports that their support is really limited. When it really, really, truly comes to like, okay, white people are like, yeah, support policies, this should be fair. Until it comes to the point where you ask white people to lose some of their privileges, and then white people are like, not really, not really. And I'm not done, but there's research, you can look it up. Because white people's support of racial justice policies stops when it becomes a matter of losing their privileges. They're not really willing to make the soccer field level. If this, the field is level, means my kids don't start with this big, huge advantage because of their skin color and their race and their gender and their ethnicity and sexual orientation and religion. Do I really wanna make it level? Or do I really want it to stay slightly tipped? White, straight, male, whatever clue, you, whatever demographic you wanna look at, we have three main ways we can, when we look at this stuff, we can deny that this is happening. We can distance ourselves from it. Or we can work to dismantle it. I'm gonna encourage you to work to dismantle it. There's gotta be a way forward. There's got to be, and there is. The third way, let's talk about culture and humility for a few minutes. Culture humility. Cultural humility is the willingness to suspend what you know or think you know about a person based on your perceptions about their perceived culture. In other words, you ask questions from a space of curiosity and respect rather than make assumptions based on implicit and explicit biases. So like cultural competence is like a box that only has so much space. Cultural humility is like a sifter. We can let go of what we don't need and take on what's important to clients, colleagues, families, and friends. So there's six components of cultural humility. I'll, be real, I'll try to be quick. Apparently I'm not good at being quick. <laughs> okay. So the first component of culture humility, we have to be other focused instead of self-focused. And this is hard for us. Our default view is always ourself. So we have to stop thinking about ourselves first and become focused on other people, including how and when do you bring up the conversation of the differences between you. Don't let that be about you. Let that be about your relationship with the other person of when you should bring up differences. So it's hard work to always be other focused, but that's the first part of cultural humility. The second component of cultural humility is it's characterized by respect for other cultures. And respect is really easy to promise, but really hard to give. Um, human beings don't like to not know. I, I'm a professor. I don't like to not know. I like to be in the, the know. So I'd rather give you a superficial impression that I understand the difference between Shiite and Sunni Muslims than really like say like, I really don't understand because I want to look like I know. And so the, the hard part is we can't give respect 
when we're always having the superficial understanding of another person's culture. We really have to work to understand it on a, on a meaningful and deeper level. So we have to be open to, to learning and to gen, um, creating true respect for other cultures instead of just a superficial understanding of like culture is good. We have to believe in the lack of superiority of our own culture. This is a human being thing. We always believe that our culture is the best. Just like you believe your team is the best, whatever your team is. We think our skin color, our habits, our religion, our holidays, our custom, our food, our style of houses, our intelligence, our values, we think they're the best. We're most comfortable with what's familiar. So the thing you know the most is the thing you like the most. It's kind of why U.S. culture has absorbed um, Latino people, Native American people, easier than Black people, easier than Muslim people, easier than a lot of other categories, because the ones that are folks that are seen as more similar are more easily absorbed, right? There's a lot of problems with that. But so what matters is then we get to things like this. We think that some things in culture are normal and better and some things in culture are weird because we have this view of like our culture is the best and it's hard for us to get out of that thing if we were in a real, real workshop we would stop and discuss these pictures with your neighbor and we would talk about the differences between the woman on the left and the woman on the right and what feels most comfortable to you and why the fourth characteristic of cultural humility is that we have to have an accurate view of ourselves and our limitations. And honestly, this sucks. It's just it's a hopeful. I mean, we always want to believe that we're there wherever there is. I always want to believe I'm there. I always want to believe I'm woke. I want to believe I'm, I'm done committing microaggressions. I want to believe I'm, I'm through it. And there's no, there's no, we always are going to be messing up. And so we always are going to be have to have this accurate understanding of ourselves as people who are learning. None of us are there. In fact, the most dangerous people are probably the people who think they're there, wherever there is that, that cultural nirvana. You know, there, there's you can't get there. We always have to be seeking out new experiences and new others. We always have to be looking for people different than us. Uh, we have to go out of our comfort zone. We have to go to places where we're the minority. We have to not just travel, but travel in the United States. Travel to places that are different than that are uncomfortable for you. Um, go be with the people you commonly stereotype. So yeah, seek out new experiences and others. The sixth component of cultural humility is you have to have a lifelong commitment to always be redressing power imbalances. So. It's not just a matter of your group being discriminated against. If any group is discriminated against, it's not okay. So I put the six components of cultural humility on one slide, and now you can see, bam, they're easy for you um, if you wanna see them uh, on one slide. So we we'll need to move to the last part of this presentation. I know it's been more than an hour and I'm sorry. There's another good quote. She had not known the weight until she felt the freedom. When you start to admit your biases and admit your privileges and see this stuff, you be, if you start to see the soccer field, the society field for what it is, it's incredibly freeing. Instead of pretending like everything's fair, if you start to say, it's not fair, it really frees you up. If you start to say, I have biases, it really frees you up. So now, in our last thing, we're going to go quickly through. 20-ish possible action steps. I like to think about what can I do about stuff, not just what do I learn. I don't like to go to a workshop and then I don't really learn anything I can do. So here's things you can do. Like how do you live with cultural humility? The first one is an introvert stream. Yo, introvert people, I'm talking to you. You're secretly gonna love this. All it is is take steps on your own diversity journey. That's all it is. Don't march for justice until you've done your own work. It is okay. Understand how you're privileged. It's, remember that it's easier for us to see our oppression than our privilege. So just reflect, journal, ask questions. Just, just pay attention to things, notice things. Think about them later in the day as you, as you consider them. Just be your own introverted self and keep learning and growing. That's important. 
If any of this stuff resonates with you, take the pieces that resonated and think of them. If some of the other things from today are too much, just take the pieces that you resonate with. Second idea is to accept wherever you are on your diversity journey. Again, when we have a human nature, is you show somebody a stage theory and they always wanna be at the end stage all the time. Instead of that, accept where you are. Wherever you are is okay. It's fine wherever you are. If you're white, deal with your white guilt on your own time, but, but deal with it and move on. A lot of times when I tell my students, I teach them about this stuff, they say, oh, do my people own slaves? If my people own slaves, this is awful. If my people didn't own slaves, I'm off the hook. It doesn't matter whether your people own slaves or not. You, you benefit from white privilege if you have white skin, right? It's our privilege that we benefit from it. Anyway, we have a long history of how white is favored in the United States. So whether your people own slaves or not, your ancestors, isn't as important as how you benefit from white privilege now. So people a lot of times get really tied up in their own guilt. Guilt's not a productive emotion. You have to deal with your guilt and move on, right? Because your pain is nothing compared to the experience of other people's pain. So deal with it and, and move on. We got to relearn history. There's a million good history books out there written by people who are within the culture who are much more powerful stories um, the half that has never been told, the, the book I told you about earlier, The Warmth of Other Suns. There's so many, there's so many good history books, podcasts that, that are a different way. I'm really into Barry Truce right now, and I'm also into all my relations and Native Indigenous um, podcasts, feminism podcasts. It, learn, learn, relearn history. The way you were taught history really glossed over some important stuff and made things not right. It was not right. So be aware of spaces that are white or straight or male. Find yourself, if you're in a restaurant that's all white or that a black person wouldn't feel comfortable in, or if you know that a gay person wouldn't be comfortable in this space, why are you frequenting spaces, churches, whatever, that other people wouldn't feel comfortable in? Are you okay with paying money to be in those spaces? Are you okay with supporting things that make it, that are, or a person of color or whatever wouldn't feel safe. Pay, pay attention to times when you're in spaces when you would feel different if you're not privileged, when you're pulled over, when you're handcuffed, when you get caught with a speeding ticket, when you're walking at night, when you're walking to your car. Would it be different if you were walking to your car as a woman, as a black person, as a whatever? Pay attention to your spaces and ask yourself, because some people think about race all the time. Some people think about gender all the time. Some people think about sexual orientation all the time. So if you're not thinking about those things, pay attention to why you're not thinking about those things and the spaces you're in that make you don't have to think about those things. Pay attention to when you think about those things. Practice difficult names ahead of time when meeting someone. So with my students, when I get like a roster, I ask ahead of time. So I can learn how to say Iben and Shante and Nardine and Amina and Nadesta and Shruti, because names, they trick me up, so, so I need to practice ahead of time of how to learn to say names, right? This is an important one. Practice language to bring up diversity in safe places that will not harm others. So if you want to talk to your new Muslim culture um, colleague about being Muslim, practice that conversation with someone who you know is an ally first. Hey, I'd like to bring this up with my new Muslim colleague. Do you think it would be okay if I asked this? And you can work on your language like a little dry run to practice your language in a, a place that, that is less likely to harm another person. So you can work out kind of the bugs a little bit. Discuss diversity with everyone, not just people you assume are diverse. Like, first of all, who, who are you? Are you the like cultural police? So you just decide who is white, who's straight, whatever. Like we make assumptions about people and then we only bring up diversity with people who are noticeably or visibly different than us. That's a problem, right? So if we go first with always opening up the dialogue, we'll have much richer dialogue. So be open to bringing up those dialogues with everyone. Here's that picture again. Recognize power differentials. Be committing to open up dialogues about them. If we're really gonna transform society and change it, 
we got to get the team at the top end of the field, that goalie who thinks he's going or she thinks she's going all state. We got to get those people to, to do some of the heavy lifting to change this, right? Because we can't just expect the folks at the marginalized end of the playing field to do all the heavy lifting. So we need cis people. We need straight people. We need white people. We need male people. We need upper SES people. We need people as allies to help us do this work. I think of this sometimes. The more racist you know, the more power you have. The more heterosexist you know, the more power you have. So if your world is full of racists, then you can do a whole lot of good in changing people's minds. Talk openly about imposter syndrome and stereotypes and how to overcome them. You know this little kid is like, why did my mom make me dress like Spider-Man and everybody else got to be Batman? People feel like they don't belong in our spaces, right? In white spaces, in, upper, in middle class spaces. When there's not enough people that look like you and talk like you, you feel like you don't belong. So make sure you talk to people about how they belong in this space. One way to do this, this important way is self-disclose more than you might. So talk with people about your own journey, um, not as a way to say, oh, I understand your hardship because I had my own, but it's okay to self-disclose, especially some of your mistakes. This is our next door neighbor in Dayton, Ohio, where I grew up. Our house is right behind this big apartment. So be able to talk about those things. Bring up a conversation about microaggression. I told you some stats, right? Like your odds, if you're a white person or a straight person, your odds of committing a microaggression are really, really high. So bring, point that out. Ask people to point out when they see you committing one. Tell people you're at high risk to commit one. So start with that and you have a lot more space to be able to say, please point it out when I do this. We all need to practice recovering from being on the committing and the receiving end of microaggressions, also on the bystanding end. We need a way to be able to, to manage that in the moment. Those are called micro interventions, by the way, things that you might say in the moment. So you could say things like, I don't agree with what you just said. Do you realize what you just did? I understand you have a right to say what you want, but I respect uh, I res I'm, values, I respect tolerance. So please don't say it around me. But just say, ouch. You could say, I know you didn't mean to hurt anybody, but I think you just did. So there's some language you can use. And I know that's really hard. But here's a powerful quote. Everyday interventions by allies and well-intended bystanders have a profound positive effect in creating an inclusive and welcoming environment, discouraging negative behavior, and reinforcing a norm that values respectful interactions. So even though it's hard, say it anyway. Another thing you can do is apologize. And remember that a good intention does not negate a bad impact. I'm sorry, it was my fault. What can I do to make it right? You gotta identify some strategies and strategies to diffuse jokes based on racism, sexism, other isms. So some jokes are funny, some jokes are not. So if someone's gonna say, hey, I'm gonna tell this joke, it's a little off color, just stop them right there and say, I don't wanna hear it. I don't wanna hear it, please don't tell it. Before the joke. If it's too late, if the joke, sometimes the joke is just out there, it's too late, you can't do anything about it. Then it's really, really important to stop right there with the joke and say, look at the person you told it and say, what about that joke made that funny? Yeah, I know that's like socially awkward, but it puts them on the spot to explain why the joke was funny and make it socially awkward for the person who told the joke. Instead of the whole room feeling the social awkwardness, make it social awkward for them. This is important too. So sometimes we'll say, I'm gonna stereotype here like, you have no idea. You don't go home for holidays with my family and here it is Thanksgiving and Uncle Billy is so racist and oh my gosh, you, I can't even begin to talk to Uncle Billy. I can't change Uncle Billy's mind. You're not trying to change Uncle Billy's mind. You're probably right, you can't change Uncle Billy's mind. But Uncle Billy's teenage son is in the room listening. Somebody else is in the room listening you're speaking up, not necessarily to change Uncle Billy's mind, but the other people in the room who are paying attention, you're speaking up for those people as well. Another important thing you can do is don't underestimate the importance of the sidekick. Sometimes somebody else says something many times and we're afraid to follow. Like somebody else speaks up for justice. They're like, that's wrong. Why did you say that? And we're just silent. Don't be silent. Be number two. 
it is incredibly powerful to be the second voice, to come in there as an ally behind someone else and say, I agree with what LaShawn just said. I, 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 I agree. That changes the whole dynamics of the room. So don't be afraid to be number two. It's okay to be Robin. We don't all have to be fat man. There's a lot of good benefits to being an ally. There's really good research to say the people who are allies live in more congruence with their values. There's some, you can see some of the pictures, some, some of the values and benefits of being an ally. So remember those benefits. And if you're overwhelmed and afraid, at least be hopeful and make a space for another person. So sometimes you're paralyzed in the moment. Sometimes you don't know what to say. And you can say something like this. Maybe things won't always be this way. Maybe things will get better. Maybe people will try to start to treat people with kindness. I know that's kind of wishy-washy, but at least if you say a hopeful statement, maybe you can gather your thoughts while you're saying something stronger. Maybe someone else in the room can make a space to say something stronger. And at least it's better than saying nothing, right? So if you're afraid of what to say, at least try that. The bottom line, if we don't do anything differently, then we just reinforce the status quo and keep the playing field uneven. We have to live intentionally. We have to work to try to change to level that playing field, ah, which is hard. So how do we change our organizations? People always want to ask me like at the end of these presentations, well, I want to change my organization. What do I do? You change yourself. The best way to change your organization is to change yourself. So change yourself. We're going to finish up with a Howard Thurman quote. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So I want you to be alive. So you can't really ask me questions because it's not that kind of a party, so I'm sorry. You can email me with questions. Thank you. I know this is hard work. It's hard work for me. It's hard work to see privilege. It's, it's hard work to talk about these things, and it's important work. Uh, you can email me at dwolfarth at spalding.edu, Dr. Didi Wolfarth. Um, I really appreciate you participating in this conversation, and we're going to end now, and I thank you very much for listening.